Okay, first thing is I want to acknowledge and thank Liz Trobin and Gary, where, where's Liz? Oh, there she is in the back. There he goes. Liz, I'm calling you out. Thank you so much. I received a phone call from Liz and she was very, very passionate in terms of bringing our guest speaker here, Mort Klein. Mort is the president of, of the Zionist Organization of America and a uh, super, super interesting man. Um, when you go back in his previous early life, early days, he worked as an economist for the, for the Nixon, Ford, and Carter administrations. So it's a kind of a nice little mix. We always love that about you. And then since then has dedicated enormous energy and time <laughs> for the benefit of the Jewish people. Linus Pauling. I worked with him for 20 years. Oh, and they also, <laughs> fantastic. And, and the Forward <laughs> newspaper, you know the Forward newspaper, also uh, uh, identified Mort as one of the five most influential Jews in North America. Is that true? Did I get that, that is, right? That is actually true. So it's also big. <laughs> so you can catch me all the time around here. And I, before we do anything, I, I want to just point out to everyone these nice little flyers, because everyone's invited for Purim, because Purim's going to be great. But for now, you don't need to get the influence from me, but with a tremendous gratitude to Liz, Gary, please, uh, please welcome Mort to come on up and share some words of wisdom. Thank you so much. Great to have you. <laughs> well, thank you all for coming out. Uh, I can't believe that you've decided to come here instead of listening to, what's his name, Biden, <laughs> doing his State of the Union. I listened for five minutes. He was already slurring his words, already, really, already slurring his words. So I didn't understand what he was saying. <clears throat> I'll, I'll try to speak louder. I'll try to, I will try to speak louder. <laughs> So there's a story by Leo Rostin, the great Jewish humorist, to exemplify how we Jews, despite all the troubles, despite all the attacks, despite all the hatred and persecution and worse that we've endured, we ultimately prevail. <laughs> he tells about Moish, who in his yarmulke uh, went into a bar, about to take a drink. As he's about to take a drink, a big, gigantic, leather a cost, uh, uh, with a leather jacket biker, comes in, grabs his drink, slurps it down, and says, so what are you going to do about this, Jew boy? <laughs> Moish started to cry hysterically immediately. The biker says, what the heck is wrong with you? I can't stand to see a man cry, even a Jew boy. <laughs> Moish responds, he said, I've had a bad time. I was late for a meeting this morning, and my boss fired me. I went to drive home, my car was stolen and I have no insurance. I took a cab home. I left my wallet in the car. I got home early, and I see my wife in the arms of one of my best friends. I run out of my house. My dog runs after me, starts biting at my leg, destroying my nice suit that I had just purchased. I was so depressed that I decided I'm going to come to the bar to get up the courage to end it all. So I put a capsule of poison in my drink. <laughs> but enough about me, Mr. Biker. How's your day going so far? <laughs> it's Leo Rostin. <laughs> um, <laughs> First of all, you should all know, uh, my wife instructs me to inform you. I have Tourette syndrome. It's a neurochemical disorder. It makes me make sounds and have facial tics I can't control. I've had it since age five. <laughs> uh, I even lost a few girlfriends before because of it. <laughs> uh, not recently, uh, by the way. <laughs> and uh, as soon as my wife showed any interest in marrying me, I married her immediately. I didn't want to be alone. <laughs> but I don't have the worst kind of Tourette. The worst time kind is you curse for no reason whatsoever. But whenever I curse, it's always for a damn good reason. <laughs> uh, <laughs> COA is the oldest pro-Israel group, one of the largest. 
we have a, uh, a government relations division, we have full-time lobbyists on the Hill, we have a campus division, we're on 100 campuses, we have a legal division where we use uh, the, the courts to promote our agenda. By the way, it is ZOA who for six years launched the campaign to change, to reinterpret Title VI of the Civil Rights Act, which said it is illegal to harass or discriminate against uh, minorities or ethnic people, but it didn't include Jews. We lobbied for six years to get Jews included under Title VI. It was never included. We begged all the major organizations to help us in this campaign. None of us would do it. In fact, saying you don't do things by suing people, you do things by diplomacy. That's what Abe Foxman told me from, from ADL by, at the time. <laughs> After six years, we look close that we're going to get this change. We got 40 members of Congress uh, to fight for this with us. <laughs> Uh, then all the organizations joined us. They were afraid that we would get full credit for this very important act. Now you see many, many uh, lawsuits under Title VI being uh, 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 lodged. Uh, we have lodged more than anyone else. <laughs> so that's uh, just one of the many, many things we've done. I have, I have a whole story about how we are the ones <laughs> who, got, uh, the, who, who really initiated getting the embassy moved. Uh, from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem, I, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and all credit is due to Senator John Kyle of Arizona. He was the greatest friend of Israel. He's, he left, he retired. <laughs> and I went to him uh, to, to say to him, let's do legislation to move this embassy. It's ridiculous. I won't, it's a whole story. I won't get into it. We have other things to talk about tonight. But John Kyle deserves great, great credit. It was a very rough campaign. <laughs> I could get no Jewish organization initially to go on the bill. They said this will only cause the Arabs to hate us more, there'll be more terrorism, this will destroy the chances for peace. I'm talking about all the major groups whose names you know refuse to help us with this. But again, once we got 40 members of the Senate on the bill, they all rushed in, afraid that we would get sole credit. It's a whole story to it, I won't get into it. <laughs> uh, before I start, I always like to show a picture of the Middle East. We have to be reminded that uh, the 22 Arab countries are all in orange, huge. Uh, Israel, which you can't see, is in yellow. That yellow is actually smaller than it is because Israel's given away 40% of Judea and Samaria, all of Gaza. So the yellow is actually smaller. Israel is one eighth of 1% this landmass of the Middle East. <laughs> and the whole world is saying uh, the way to resolve this is land for peace. And who's giving up the land? Not that it works, we know it doesn't work. That's another story we'll talk about in a moment. <laughs> Imagine, by the way, suppose there were 22 Jewish countries, these orange, and there was one little Arab country in yellow. And Israel was saying, we want a 23rd Jewish country carved out of this tiny Arab country. You think the world would say, good idea? They'd say, you Jews are disgusting, leave the Arabs alone, they have nothing, you have 22 countries, it's enough already. But when, with the Jews, no. They're now pushing more than ever before, right now, for a Palestinian Arab terrorist state. <laughs> I want everyone to understand that America, since the very beginning of our creation, the leaders of America and the citizens of America have been extremely supportive of the Jewish people and the Jewish state. Uh, President Lincoln, many times in his speeches, would say, reestablishing Israel is a noble dream shared by many Americans. Uh, President John Adams uh, would say many times, I really wish the Jews would reestablish Judea as an independent Jewish nation. <laughs> in 1891, uh, 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 top Methodist leader William Blackstone uh, put together a petition to President Harrison to induce and plead and demand that the Ottoman Empire turn the region of Palestine, it's a region, it's not a country, it's a region, uh, over to the Jews. He got 400 signatories, 1891. The Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, the Speaker of the House, the Chairman of Ways and Means, the Chairman of Foreign Affairs, future President William McKinley, mayors of Baltimore, Boston, Chicago, New York, Philadelphia, Washington, editors of the leading newspapers, leading Episcopalian ministers, Methodist, Presbyterian, Catholic clergy, business leaders like Rockefeller and Morgan, all signed this in 1891, demanding a Jewish state. We should understand how much America has cared about the Jewish people. By the way, uh, Teddy Roosevelt made speeches saying, it is entirely proper to start a Zionist state around Jerusalem. Teddy Roosevelt. And I can really go on and on. Uh, 
<coughs> of, the, of the leaders uh, uh, promoting this agenda <coughs> of, of Israel estab being established as a Jewish state. <coughs> and how many of you know this? <coughs> when our, uh, uh, when our uh, leaders who were creating, re creating America <coughs> were looking for a seal, one group wanted a seal that we have now of the uh, eagle uh, 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 on our seal. <coughs> Three others and many others wanted a different seal. Benjamin Franklin, Thomas Jefferson, John Adams, all promoted to have a seal showing Moses uh, uh, staring at the shore, at the sea, the Nile, extending his hand over the sea, causing the sea to overwhelm Pharaoh and his military, the story of the Exodus, <laughs> and raise from a pillar of fire in the clouds, reaching out to Moses in this seal, to express that he's acting by command over the deity of Hashem, or God, and the children of Israel looking on. These three giants in our history wanted that to be the seal. That's the closeness they felt to the Jewish people and what the Jewish people represented. By a very tiny margin, the eagle won over for the seal, but Moses almost became the seal of the United States of America. And in 1948, when Israel was trying to be reestablished, Clark Clifford, the White House Chief Counsel, <laughs> went to Truman, pleading with him to vote for it, saying this comports with America's traditional values. <laughs> and, and, and Clark Clifford, who was the Chief White House Counsel, would make speeches, uh, regularly quoting from the book, book of Deuteronomy. He would say from Deuteronomy, Behold, I have set the land before you. Go in and possess the land which I, the Lord, swore unto you and to your fathers and to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob to give unto them and to their seed and to them this land. <laughs> and then Clifford would also make it clear that the polls show by three to one in 1948, Americans supported establishing a state. <laughs> and Truman then, in fact, did vote to reestablish that state. <laughs> and even today, <laughs> America still has, the people still have a love affair and support for Israel over, over America's, uh, over the enemies of Israel. Recent polls show 82% support Israel's war against the Hamas Nazis, 82%. It should be 100, but Ilan Omar, unfortunately, are in America at this time. <laughs> so we should feel good. This country is a great supporter of our people, and rightly so. We deserve it. It's a righteous thing to do. <laughs> you know, things are very bad now with Hamas. <laughs> But we shouldn't be so shocked. In our Passover Haggadah that we read every year, every Pesach we read in the Haggadah, as all of you will recall, in each and every generation, they rise up against the Jews to destroy us. And the Holy One, blessed be He, God Almighty, rescues us from their hands. When I would read this as a kid, I would think this is ridiculous. It's over with people being against us since the Holocaust. We see it's not over. And it won't be over until the Mashiach comes. I don't know why, but that is our fate. And that is what we're living in. <laughs> and this has been true throughout history. But every time we've been attacked and we've had serious issues, we have overcome them and prevailed every single time. <laughs> we're slaves in Egypt, we survived. Haman attempted genocide of the Jews, we survived. The Greeks outlawed Judaism, the Maccabees fought them, destroyed them, we survived. 2,000 years ago, the Romans massacred 600,000 Jews, renamed our whole land of Judea and Samaria, Philistinia. They named it after the Philistines, our enemy, to stick it to us. <laughs> and we overcame it. <laughs> In 624 and beyond, Muhammad's Muslims beheaded thousands of Jews. The first and second Christian crusades against the Jews, we survived. In the Middle Ages, the Jews were blamed for the Black Plague and blamed for killing Christian children to use their blood to make matzahs. They murdered Jews throughout Europe because of this insanity. You know, we're not even, we Jews are not even allowed to eat blood. It's against our Torah. We, when we have, make chicken or other meats, we put heavy salt on it to absorb all the blood. And yet this is the insanity that's promoted. To this day, these types of insane propaganda lies are promoted against the Jews. But we survived. We were expelled from France, Germany, Hungary, Austria, Spain, and Portugal in 1492. Uh, we survived. Pogroms, we survived. Even the Holocaust, where three quarters of European Jewry were murdered. <laughs> we survived. And the 1948 reestablishment of the state of Israel, six Arab nations tried to destroy us in a remarkable miracle that is enough to make you believe that there's a God in this earth, a God in heaven. <laughs> we overcame six 
six Arab countries and reestablish our state. <laughs> and now Hamas uh, perpetrated this horrific massacre and forced Israel into a war that they did not want. <laughs> and by the way, what Hamas did, it's not only the massacre, murder, rape, and mutilation of Jewish, innocent Jewish people. <laughs> They've also made southern Israel and northern uh, Israel, because of Hezbollah, uninhabitable. They've shrunken this already tiny state. That's why it's so critical that we destroy these Hamas and Arab Nazis. <laughs> and we should understand, uh, uh, the Hamas attacks in Israel didn't start, uh, didn't happen uh, October uh, 7th for the first time. Since 2005, when Sharon gave away the rest of Gaza, by the way, 85% of Gaza was given away in Oslo. People don't realize this. It was called Gaza Jericho first. Sharon gave away the Jewish area of Gaza. He gave away an area where there were 9,000 Jews and two or 3,000 Arabs. <laughs> a horrible mistake. And as soon as they took it over, there was an election. Uh, uh, Israel pleaded with Condoleezza Rice and Bush not to allow Hamas to be in the election because they might win. And they said, this is a democracy. They'll never win. They're lunatics, Hamas. Well, they won overwhelmingly. <laughs> and since 2005, 30,000 rockets have been launched from Gaza into Israel, <laughs> attempting to murder large numbers of Jews. It is a miracle that most of these rockets have landed in empty areas. Yeah, what is the odds of that? It's almost nothing. It's incredible that all these rockets keep missing. More proof that God must be with us in these sorts of circumstances. <laughs> So this has been going on for a long time. Uh, uh, Hamas, of course, we have to always remember, is an arm of Iran, funded by Iran, uh, armed by Iran, uh, and Iran vows to destroy America as well as to Israel. On their missiles, Iran puts death to America, other missiles, death to Israel. They want to destroy the big Satan that they call America, as well as the little Satan uh, that they refer to as Israel. By the way, Iran, most people don't know this, they trained Al-Qaeda pilots and the terrorists facilitating their travel, and Iran was behind planning 9-11. And it, I've almost never read that truth. <coughs> That's what kind of monstrous and evil uh, Iran is. <coughs> you should also know about Hamas that their own charter, Article 7, calls for the murder of every Jew in the world. For the murder of every Jew in the world, they don't write about this. Article 13, for the destruction of Israel. And you should also remember that these Hamas terrorists murdered 33 Americans. There are 33 Americans among the 1,200 that was murdered, and 10 Americans are being held uh, hostage. <laughs> but the resilience and perseverance and courage of the Jewish people, with the help of God, we will overcome this ultimately. This, this attempt, they are the ones attempting genocide. They're the ones that's saying we want to kill every Jew, not the Jews. This is another, this is as big a propaganda line, maybe bigger than saying we killed Christians uh, to take Christian children's blood to make matzah. They make up these insane lies that aren't anywhere near the truth. <laughs> I wanted to mention a few lessons to learn <laughs> about this attack. First of all, one lesson, had Israel not forcibly thrown out 9,000 Jews and our idea from northern Gaza, this couldn't have happened. Sharon made a horrible mistake. This wouldn't have happened had we not left Gaza. Uh, and this really teaches a lesson. We Jews, the Israelis, should never give another inch of land away to these Arab Nazis, to these Hamas Nazis. They only use it, they only use it to better operate their ugly plans, to have more area to operate. No more concessions. Also, our government has moved to give Iran, they did, they, uh, uh, access to $16 billion in, in the last few months. And this administration has ignored every sanction that was put in place, ignored every sanction. So they're selling oil and other things to other countries, which is not allowed under, under American law. <laughs> they have gone because of ignoring these sanctions from $4 billion in reserves. Iran was on their, le on their backs. They were almost bankrupt. Four billion in reserves, now they have over a hundred billion in reserves. And what do they do with this money? They fund Hamas, they fund Hezbollah, they fund Islamic Jihad. They're the sponsor of uh, terrorism, Arab terrorism in this world. I say Arab terrorism. It's not Finnish terrorism or Danish terrorism uh, or Argentinian terrorism. It is Arab terrorism. <laughs> you know, I just tweeted something out condemning Arab terrorism. Uh, X or, tw or 
Twitter, whatever it's called these days, <laughs> uh, deleted it. They wouldn't let me say Arab terrorism. Is that something? I, I had to simply say terrorism. This just happened this, this past week. <laughs> Another thing we've learned is the horrible mistakes that have been made by our government that has inspired what's happened. Our government has publicly condemned Israel for illegally veering away from democratic values, nonsense, attacked Israelis' domestic policies, funded anti-Israel government protests, yes, the protests you saw in Israel under, under the judicial reforms anticipated, America helped fund those protesters. Uh, they condemn Israel for indiscriminate bombings, uh, for, and they're, 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 they've sanctioned 11 citizens of Israel. Imagine a foreign country sanctioning citizens of another country whose own very fine uh, legal system knows how to handle with it, and they, they handle it. What are we doing sanctioning uh, 11 Israelis and threatening to sanction Minister Stro Smotrich and Ben Gavir? Two ministers, two officials of Israel, they said we're thinking of sanctioning them. What world are we living in? They haven't sanctioned a single Palestinian Arab, a single Gaza Arab, or a single person from any other country. Not, not from Iraq or Russia or China, only Israel. Sounds a little like anti-Semitism, doesn't it? Sounds a little like anti-Semitism. I don't know what else to call it. <laughs> <laughs> and we made a horrible mistake of funding the Palestinian Authority. The Palestinian Authority was getting zero money in the last administration. Why? <laughs> because we passed the Taylor Force Act that simply says, a very simple, if you keep paying Arabs to murder Jews, we're not going to give you any money. If you stop paying Arabs to murder Jews, you'll get $800 million. <laughs> Biden has ignored it and gives them 800 million a year and gives UNRWA 600 million a year. <laughs> All of this has encouraged and energized and inspired Iran and Hamas and Hezbollah terrorists that, th that their support for Israel is weakening. <laughs> and only uh, in the last day or two, I was forced to add this into my very short speech that I'm giving. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Uh, uh, Biden tonight in this, in this speech <laughs> is going to support uh, uh, America building a port uh, in the, on the waters next to Gaza. Building a port so, th to, so they can facilitate more food and aid and whatnot coming into Gaza. 60% of this aid is stolen by Hamas or more. We all know this. And there's going to be no Americans that are monitoring this. You're going to have anti-Israel NGOs monitoring this, and maybe Arabs monitoring this. Of course they're not going to stop uh, this, 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 these goods from going to Hamas uh, uh, <coughs> hands. Uh, uh, and also, by having this port, it's much easier for Arabs to bring in weapons. Uh, and this is a horrible mistake. He's announced this, I'm told, this very night <coughs> to do this. This is a horrible act of hostility toward Israel. And all, they should be pressuring Egypt to allow uh, aid coming from Egypt into Gaza, or they should pressure Egypt to allow any Arabs who want to leave Gaza to move into Egypt. Egypt's not allowing it. We should be pressuring Egypt, saying, those Arabs who want to leave, they're your brethren, they're, your, they're Muslims, they're Arabs, let them move into huge Egypt. Uh, and we're not doing that. <laughs> and the second thing that most of you probably don't know about, uh, there was a memo in early February put out by the, the Biden-Obama administration. Biden-Obama administration. I'll explain that in a second for those who are not aware. <laughs> that if Israel violates international humanitarian law, we can cut aid in arms. This is a memo that was put out in early February. It's been ignored. <laughs> Yesterday, 20 congressmen sent a letter to Biden saying if Israel goes into Rafah, which they need to, to destroy Hamas. Most of the officials are there now. Uh, if they do that, they're violating the memo you put out. They're violating international human rights law. And we urge you to cut all arms and aid to Israel. 20 people. Three of them were Jews. Jamie Raskin of Maryland, Shakovsky of Illinois, and Susan Wilder of Pennsylvania signed this along with the usual suspects who hate Jews. This is just yesterday. <laughs> Another thing we learned that has helped inspire Hamas and Iran is they saw administration working to fight anti-Semitism along with the anti-Semitism czar, 
Deborah Lipstadt. <laughs> the very left-wing Deborah Lipstadt. <laughs> Lipstadt and, and the administration allowed CARE to be involved in putting together this uh, definition. CARE, who not only hates Israel and Jews, they publicly praised October 7th. Do you hear what I'm saying? CARE publicly praised it, no consequence to them by, uh, by praising it. <laughs> they adopted... Uh, uh, a very good part of the uh, definition, the, uh, called the IRA definition, which is very good, I won't get into it. <laughs> but also, uh, they included in it nexus, the nexus definition. <laughs> they said this is a wonderful addition to the IRA definition, is the nexus definition. And Lipstadt allowed that to happen. <laughs> what does the nexus definition say? <laughs> it says if you oppose Israel's existence, it's not anti-Semitism. The nexus, we have now formally adopted a definition saying, if you say Israel shouldn't exist, it means you don't want Israel to exist, doesn't mean you hate Jews. I mean, if you don't want Italy to exist, doesn't mean you hate Italians, you love Italians, you just don't want Italy to exist, right? If you don't want Spain to exist, you don't hate Spanish people, you just don't want Spain to exist. Nonsense. <laughs> and this, all our enemies saw this, and are, again, were energized against the Jews by this. <laughs> and another serious issue, <laughs> that we should have been aware of is that this administration has refused to condemn the Jew-hating members of their party and of Congress. They have refused to condemn Rashida Tlaib, Ilan Omar, Betty McClintock, Presley, AOC, Cori Bush. In fact, this president has actually praised Tlaib and Omar, praised them. He said about Rashida Tlaib, maybe the worst Jew-hater in Congress. Biden said publicly, Rashida, I admire your intellect. I admire your passion. I admire your concern for so many other people. From my heart, I pray that your family and members are well in Palestine. I promise you, I'll do everything to see to it that they're well. You are a fighter. God, thank you for being such a great fighter. That's an exact quote from Biden to the worst anti-Semite in Congress. And nobody condemned him for it in the Jewish world. We did. Where was APAC, ADL, AJ Committee, B'nai B'rith? All of them condemning. How dare you? How dare you praise a, a vicious Jew hater? So he saw there's no consequence to this. When there's no response, when there's silence, it shows there's no consequence. <laughs> Furthermore, <laughs> almost everyone that Biden has appointed to important posts that affect Israel are people extremely hostile to Israel. <laughs> and no one has complained about it except us, COA. <laughs> he appointed Robert Malley. He's now been fired. Robert Malley was the chief U.S. negotiator to Iran, overtly, extremely pro-Iran, against sanctions in Iran and pro-Hamas. This is who he makes the liaison to uh, Iran. <laughs> the director of intelligence and national security council, Maher Bitar. Maher Bitar was the executive director of Students for Justice in Palestine, SJP, a vicious anti-Israel student group. <laughs> he held seminars every year at Georgetown, which were entitled, How to Demonize Israel. How to Demonize Israel. Maher Bitar is head of national, uh, director of intelligence and national security council. Who is the chief negotiator for the U.S. between Israel and the Palestinians? Hadi Amar. Hadi Amar... <laughs> has proclaimed that the Intifada terror war against the Jews, this has inspired me. What a beautiful thing for them to fight their rights with the Intifada, which of course was murdering and, ma and, and maiming Jews. <laughs> and he's also a public supporter of BDS. <laughs> and many, many more. These are terrible people. All of them happen to be friends of Barack Hussein Obama. <laughs> uh, uh, so we know who's behind these appointments. It's a whole other story about the details. <laughs> but they're all hostile to Israel. Not a single Jewish organization said a word. Not APAC, ADL, AJ Committee, the Conference of Presidents, only us. <laughs> and I was called by leaders of Jewish groups pleading with me not to do this. Don't condemn Bi Biden's appointments. He'll only make him more angry at us. Leave him alone. Yes, the biggest leaders in America called me, begging me to not criticize these appointments. We all should have been criticizing them. If these... Yes. <laughs> if these were anti-black appointments, do you think the blacks might say something? Would they say, oh, we better not upset Biden? He'll be even angry at us? It's pathetic. <laughs> and now the world is proposing 
to, to give huge amounts of aid, including funds, because Biden says the Gaza Palestinians are not Hamas. They're just innocent civilians. They're not Hamas. They want nothing to do with Hamas. So give them aid, humanitarian aid, funding. Let's help them. They're not Hamas. <laughs> what do their own polls show in the last few weeks? 75 to 95 percent of the Gaza Palestinians and the Palestinian Authority, Palestinians in Judea and Samaria, praise and support Hamas and October 7th. 75 to 95 percent. And when I'm asked, well, how do you know uh, that they're not pressured into this? They're afraid to say otherwise. Well, when they brought dead, naked Jewish bodies into Gaza, who they massacred in, 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 in Israel proper, thousands of people are out there screaming and thrilled and, and spitting on the bodies and hitting the bodies and praising the people. This is who this culture is. We have to look at this because it's true. We can't fool ourselves thinking, oh, if you do this and this and this, uh, everything will be fine. <laughs> yeah, you know, uh, uh, Rabbi Soloveitchik, as I mentioned to the rabbi earlier, said the miracle of, ha of, ha of Purim is not that we won over Haman. Rabbi Soloveitchik says the miracle was not that we defeated Haman. The miracle is for the only time in history the Jews believed uh, the enemy saying we're going to kill all of you, that they actually believed it. Right? Hamas says we want to kill all of you. The Palestinian Authority says it. We don't believe, ah, they're just saying, look, let them, uh, they're just appealing to their extremists. Oh, that's okay, you can appeal to extremists who want to kill you? <laughs> the Arabs have gained growing support in America on college campuses throughout the world by demonizing Israel, lying about Israel with the ugliest propaganda lies. <laughs> They proclaim, Israel has stolen our holy land. They oppress our people. They make our lives miserable. They murder our babies. They murder our children. They've taken away all of our human rights. They won't give even us a small state where we can live our lives in peace and harmony. They have checkpoints making our lives miserable. <laughs> and over the years, <clears throat> this has surely led to increased anti-Zionism, which of course has morphed in openly into anti-Semitism, <laughs> Jew hatred. <laughs> Since the Arabs have gained support and influence by lying about us, it is high time, because it has not happened to this minute, that Jewish leaders, Israeli leaders, and rabbis start telling the truth about the issues used to hurt the Jewish state. There's no pushback from Israel or Jewish leaders on the lies of the Palestinian Authority. <laughs> the big lie you see on campus is what? Stop the genocide. That's a big, stop the genocide. Have you heard any Israeli official or, frankly, even Jewish leader make a speech what, what nonsense this is? No pushback. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> officials committing uh, genocide, why do they drop leaflets all over the place before they bomb a building to get the Arabs out? Why do they call their cell phones? Why do they have knock bombs on the roofs of the buildings to warn them, get out and we're going to hit this building? That's a hell of a way to commit genocide. Uh, instead, they go door to door instead of bombing from above. <laughs> Colonel Jack Kemp said Israel is the most humane army in history. He's a very well-known uh, army official in England. <laughs> Professor John Spencer of West Point, who studies this sort of thing, says Israel has implemented more measures to prevent civilian casualties in this Hamas war than any military has ever done in history. That's a hell of a way to commit genocide. <laughs> Uh, moreover, I remember when I was at Brown University a couple of years ago speaking, and, I met, and somebody, uh, an Arab, asked me a question afterwards. He said, Mr. Klein, why aren't you talking about the genocide Israel? This is two years ago, is committing against the Arabs. You're afraid to talk about the genocide, aren't you, Mr. Klein? <laughs> I said, you know, it's interesting you asked that question. Because in 1948, there were 150,000 Palestinian Arabs in this area. Today, it has grown from 150,000 to 2 million Arabs. I said, whoever's in charge of Israel's genocide program has to be fired immediately. He's doing a lousy job. When I said that, first time I ever answered that question, first time anyone ever asked me that, silence. There were 200 brown kids there. There were so many kids because the front page of the brown newspaper and an editorial called me every name in the book, a lunatic extremist. And so kids were interested. Well, I want to hear this lunatic extremist. So they got, they got me a very nice crowd. I, I, I wrote them a thank you letter. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, silence. The next day in the brown paper, one of the students called me and read it to me. It said, 
Mr. Klein expressed chagrin that the genocide program wasn't working. <laughs> now, fortunately, I didn't go to Brown, so I didn't know what chagrin meant. So, so, it, didn't, so it didn't bother me. <laughs> By the way, the civilian situation, <clears throat> they launched missile, missiles from mosques, hospitals, homes, community centers. So when Israel wants to destroy those launchers, they're forced to kill civilians because, because Hamas is violating international humanitarian law by, having, by being embedded in civilian areas against international law. No one says a word about that Hamas <laughs> does this. Despite that fact, right now the ratio of the number of civilians killed to Hamas uh, terrorists killed is one to one. One civilian killed for every Hamas terrorist. <laughs> the average throughout history in wars is nine to one. Nine times as many civilians as, 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 as military people. <laughs> it's an extraordinary number because Israel goes to such lengths, endangering our own troops <laughs> to, protect, <clears throat> to protect Arabs. And we don't push back on this. And the big thing we want to push back, what are the what are big signs saying besides uh, end the genocide? End the occupation! End the occupation! You've stolen our land, you steal our land. We had a beautiful country. Is there really an occupation? Occupation means that someone has illegally stolen <laughs> someone else's sovereign land. That's occupation. You've illegally stolen someone else's sovereign land. <laughs> Was this someone else's sovereign land? <laughs> the British legally controlled this in 1917. <laughs> A bunch of uh, international laws were enacted. <laughs> the League of Nations Covenant, the British Mandate for Palestine, the UN Charter Article 8, the San Remo Resolution, Lodge Fist Resolution, 1924 Anglo-American Convention, <laughs> Uh, mandating that this area of Palestine be mandated for the Jewish state. Under international law, this was not anyone's country. This was, uh, in fact, legally Britain who mandated it for the Jewish state. Uh, so originally, uh, all of this, this is now Jordan, all of this was mandated for a Jewish state. In 1922, Britain, for various reasons, to pay back uh, the king of Jordan, gave 80% of original Palestine away, 80%. What's left is only 20% of Palestine. They've already got 80% that was given away in 1922, and, and 20% is left. Then Resolution 181, which recommended a two states, a original two-state solution, it wasn't law, by the way, it was recommended. <laughs> the Arab state is the, is the gray, and the yellow is Israel. And they turned it down. So Israel was taking uh, maybe 10% of original Palestine, and Israel said yes. The Arabs said no, <laughs> invaded Israel to try uh, to destroy it, <laughs> and uh, lost. <laughs> so, so there's no occupation. <laughs> when Jordan captured Judea and Samaria, the West Bank, and Eastern Jerusalem in the 48 war, only two countries recognize it. So they have no legal rights to this area, Jordan. <laughs> uh, you should also know, there's never been a Palestinian Arab country. Never. It's a, and it's a Roman name. Remember I told you, the Romans named it Philistinia. It's a Roman name. If it's their land, if it was their country, why do they have a Roman name? And let me tell you something else about it. Arabs can't pronounce the letter P. Do you name it a country that you can't even pronounce? They can't say Palestine. They say ba Palestine, Palestine. They can't say P. So this was never their country. It was never a country. There are no Palestinian kings and queens. <laughs> Moreover, how about this? Israel's given away essentially 40% of Judea and Samaria, the West Bank, 100% of Gaza. That's where 99% of the Arabs live. They run their own lives. There's no occupation. The only difference, frankly, between real sovereignty and what the Palestinians control in Judea and Samaria and Gaza is security. <laughs> Israel maintains the right to have our people, our troops go in there and root out the terror cells, which evolve regularly. It's to protect our people. Outside of that, they run their own lives. The Palestinian Authority and Gaza have their own parliament, schools, textbooks, newspapers, radio and TV, businesses, police force. The only difference is we have security there. <laughs> so this is a gigantic lie. <laughs> There's an occupation. Have you ever heard one Israeli official or one Jewish leader, said maybe me, <laughs> make a speech that this occupation uh, uh, allegation is absolute nonsense? <laughs> By the way, even Eugene Rostown in 242, or Resolution 242 in 67 after the war, 
Eugene Rossell was the undersecretary of state, later became dean of Yale Law School. He said, the, upon f f thorough study of this issue, the Jews have the best legal claim to this area, much better than the Arabs. Uh, the former president of the International Court of Justice, Stephen Schwebel, he said the same. The Jews have the greatest claim legally. I'm not talking about Torah or what God promised us or historically or politically. Legally, the Jews have the best claim. There is no occupation, and I don't hear Jewish leaders or Israeli leaders saying it. I don't hear any pushback on this. <laughs> By the way, how about this? Even the PLO Covenant, the PLO Covenant, Article 24, let me tell you what it says. This organization, the PLO, <laughs> does not exercise any territorial sovereignty over the West Bank or the Gaza Strip. How do you like that? They acknowledge it's not theirs. That, and in 1988, King Hussein publicly relinquished their claim and their right to Judea and Samaria. He said, we, we, have no, we have no rights, we don't want anything to do with it. Whatever happens, happens. He relinquished it. There's no occupation, and that's all I hear. Every Arab who goes on TV or radio, occupation, occupation, occupation. They've stolen our land. They threw us out. This was our beautiful home. <laughs> By the way, even the word Palestine, you should know, <laughs> always meant Jew until the late 60s. <laughs> Remember, the, 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 the present Israel, the homeland, is called the Palestine Mandate. The first Jewish paper, Palestine Post. The first Jewish orchestra, Palestine Orchestra. <laughs> in fact, in the movie Exodus, how many of you saw the movie Exodus? Are you old enough to have seen it? You just... Very nice. I just spoke uh, to the Adelson School and asked, how many did you see Exodus? They didn't know what I was talking about. <laughs> <laughs> Who starred in the Exodus? Paul Newman. Paul Newman. <laughs> Half Jew. Dad was Jewish. Had a store. Of course he had a store. And, uh, <laughs> and his mother was not. <laughs> By the way, he always considered himself Jewish. In the movie, he's Ari ben Kanan. He's, a, he's an Israeli Jew. He's sitting there with a Shiksa girlfriend. That's right, I don't mean disrespect for that. It was a girlfriend, she happened not to be Jewish yet. I'm sure she would have converted. <laughs> and he says to her in the movie, I am a Sabra. And she says, what is a Sabra? And he says, a Sabra is a native-born Palestinian. You like that? A native-born Palestinian. Because everyone understood Palestinian meant Jew. We've forgotten that. that it only meant Arab in the late 60s that that, start, that falsehood started becoming true. <laughs> And what about Jerusalem? Uh, they always scream, Jerusalem is the capital of Palestine. Uh, it's our holy capital. We want Jerusalem. <laughs> is there any pushback on Jerusalem? Is Jerusalem really holy to Muslims? Yeah. Is it really holy to Muslims? Amen. If you want to come up and explain that, I'd be happy to. Uh, <laughs> but you're right. <laughs> it was the capital of, king, of Israel under King David 3,000 years ago. Never the capital of any nation except Israel. When the Arabs conquered Palestine in 716, they made Rome their capital, not Israel. <laughs> That area is called the Temple Mount because our Jewish temple was there. It's not called the Mosque Mount, the Temple Mount. <laughs> the majority of people living in Jerusalem since the first census in 1850, Jews were the majority since 1850. I have a, I have a guide to Jerusalem in 1906. There are various reasons I have it. I won't get into that. The guide in 1906 says there were 60,000 people in Jerusalem, 13,000 Christians, 7,000 Muslims, 40,000 Jews. Two-thirds of Jerusalem in 1906 were Jewish people, not Muslims. <laughs> Our Jewish holy books mentions Jerusalem 700 times. The Koran, this extremely holy city of Jerusalem, how many times is it in their, Jewish, or their Quranic holy book? Exactly right. It's not there. How can that be if it's so holy to them? <laughs> it was a famous city. <laughs> it's never mentioned. <laughs> the PLO Covenant <laughs> in 64 doesn't even mention Jerusalem. Because everyone knows this was Israel's uh, holy city. <laughs> I wrote an article about this in the Washington Post explaining this. There were seven letters attacking me bitterly. <laughs> and, they, and some of them said, well, Muhammad went from Jerusalem to heaven. That's our holy prophet. He went from Jerusalem. That's why it's holy to us. Muhammad went. Well, is that what the Koran says? Well, these guys are either lying or didn't read the Koran. <laughs> the Koran says Muhammad had a dream. It didn't even happen. He had a dream. I have dreams. I'm grateful that most of them don't happen. <laughs> it said he had a dream. He went from the farthest place to heaven. The farthest mosque. The farthest mosque to heaven. And they said, well, that's Jerusalem. Well, I'm sorry, but when the Koran was written, there was not a single mosque in Jerusalem. So if he went from the furthest mosque, it ain't in Jerusalem. There were no mosques there. So this is another gigantic falsehood. 
perpetrated by the Arabs <laughs> about Jerusalem. <laughs> and uh, from 1948 to 67, Jordan controlled Jerusalem. They won it in that war. <laughs> they allowed, if it's so holy to them, why did they allow it to be a slum? Uh, virtually no water, electricity, plumbing. <laughs> there were 58 shuls in Jerusalem. What did Jordan do with those shuls? They dynamited every single one of them. They destroyed them to eliminate any proof that Jews uh, uh, lived there or they had any connection to it. If it's so holy to them, why is it that not a single Arab leader, except from Jordan, ever visited Jerusalem when they controlled it for 19 years? They never went there. They didn't care about it. Mecca and Medina are their holy places, not Jerusalem. This is a lie to take our soul away from us. <laughs> and I haven't heard a single Israeli official or Jewish leader make a speech that Jerusalem is not holy to Muslims, it's off the table. Why did Israel put it on the table? I said to Rabin, how could you put that on the table to negotiate Jerusalem? He said, I'm going to tell them, but you don't give it to you. I said, once you put it on the table, you have to compromise on it. You're saying they have some right. They have no rights. You wouldn't put Tel Aviv on the table. No. Well, then how do you put Jerusalem on the table? It was a ridiculous mistake. <laughs> We're afraid to tell the truth that Jerusalem is a holy Jewish city. It is not a holy Muslim city. Never was. <laughs> settlements. How many know that since Oslo began, <laughs> not a single Jewish settlement has been built? Zero. There's a few hilltop houses being built, but no serious community <laughs> has been built. The, yes, there has been building, but the building is within the existing borders in 1993 of the communities there. Afrat, Ariel, Hebron, within the existing borders. No new communities uh, since 2000, 1993. <laughs> and in fact, another thing that isn't mentioned is what percentage of Judea and Samaria do the Jewish communities encompass? 50%, 70%, 30%, 3%. 3%. We have controlled almost no part of Judea and Samaria. Israel, unfortunately, is not building all over the place. <laughs> Moreover, why can't 600,000 Jews in Judea and Samaria live in any potential Palestinian entity if two million Arabs can live in Israel. What kind of nonsense is that? When I say that to people, they say, oh, well, Jews wouldn't be able to live there. They'll be killed. I said, you want to set up a state that wants to kill any Jew who might be there? That's okay. That you support that type of state? This is nonsense. <laughs> That's what I hear. <laughs> you know, I ask college kids when I speak on campuses, should I mention apartheid? We all know that's nonsense. No, mention it. The kids believe it. That's what they tell me. I'm shocked by that. <laughs> Israel's an apartheid state. <laughs> Arabs serve as ambassadors, as government ministers, as high-ranking army officers, as heads of the border police. Twelve members of the Knesset out of 120 are, 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 are Arabs. 20% of Haifa University, similarly Hebrew University, 10% of the faculty are Israeli Arabs. Jewish surgeons and doctors operate side by side on, uh, on Arab and Jewish patients in Israel's hospitals. <laughs> they have full rights. This apartheid is thoroughly nonsensical. Even that, I don't hear major talks about it. <laughs> and one of the things I hear when I speak on campuses is Mahmoud Abbas, he's a moderate peace seeker. He just wants to have a little state and have peace. And we don't tell the truth about Mahmoud Abbas. <laughs> Uh, the worst Bibi Netanyahu says about Abbas, Abbas, he's not a partner for peace. Boy, that's really rough language, isn't it? He's not a partner for peace. Hitler is not a partner for peace. I think he'd say something a little stronger than that. He's a monster killer. He's a monster killer. <laughs> His PhD thesis denies the Holocaust. He makes speeches saying no Jew will be allowed to live in any future state. He calls Jews great liars and fakers of history. He has parades after a terrorist a known terrorist is killed, he has a parade honoring him. He glorifies them. He's anti-gay and anti-women. He pays lifetime pensions to murder Jews. It's amazing that the college kids never heard of this. And by the way, most Jews have never heard of it. He spends $400 million a year to pay lifetime pensions to Arabs to murder Jews. The more Jews you murder, the larger your lifetime pension. He, he names street schools and sports teams and athletic tournaments and children's camps after terrorists, he honors them by naming them after him. <laughs> he, he is an absolute monster, and we have not demonized the demon. We don't make it clear that he's horrible. It should be shameful and completely unacceptable to support Abbas, and yet we've not, we Jews have not done it, not Jewish leaders, not Israeli leaders. <laughs> Abbas also, uh, whenever you kill a Jew, you get a poster like this. You get a poster like this showing the killer 
This is two egghead busage being blown up. That's a Jewish star in the blue, blood running through it. It calls him a hero and a martyr in Arabic. A poster for every killer. They're all over the Arab high schools and the universities. Praising and honoring monster killers of Jewish people. <laughs> on Arab TV, they teach Arabs on TV how to slice Jewish necks, how to use your cars to ram into Jews to kill them. It's on TV regularly. And imams preach this. We don't say that. We don't make that clear. <laughs> and the Fatah Charter, the ruling party's charter, this is it right here. <laughs> I'll just read a couple of articles. The charter says, we oppose any political solution offered as an alternative to demolishing the Zionist occupation in Palestine. We want the eradication of Zionist economic, political, military, and cultural existence. This struggle will not cease and thus the Zionist state is demolished and Palestine is completely liberated. Armed public revolution is the only way to liberate Palestine, on and on. <laughs> this is nightmarish. Imagine if Israel had anything like this, and no one knows about this. And the Jews of America and Israel don't make it clear. We're dealing with a monster. They don't believe this matters. They think he's just saying it. They just wrote it. It doesn't matter. Thank God we believed Haman. We don't believe the Arabs. <laughs> and, and, and these are Abbas's uh, atlases. This is a real atlas used first to 12th grade. <laughs> Here's where Israel is. The green there, it says West Bank. This green says Gaza. The yellow, which is Israel within the 67 line, what does it say in the atlas? Palestine. Israel is not mentioned in their atlases. Their textbooks have chapters regularly all over the place. Jews are evil, Jews are the enemy, Jews are fanatics, Jews kill Muslims and Christians, Jews are treacherous, Jews are enemies of the prophets, Jews foment wars, Jews are evil racists, on and on and on, teaching little kids to hate us and to kill us. <laughs> on television, I have beautiful Arab girls like this. Uh, when asked about suicide bombing, she said, what could be better than going to paradise? They have whole conversations with many Arab kids saying it's a beautiful thing to be a martyr and go to heaven uh, for your country. No one knows this. This is a monstrous, monstrous culture. <laughs> and Joseph Lelyveld, years ago, was the editor of the New York Times, wrote an article. He said, I visited a family of the suicide bomber Ismail al-Masawibi. I was shocked, this is in the New York Times by Joseph Lelyveld, shocked to hear the bomber's mother declaring when I went to the, to the family of a suicide bomber, quote, I was very happy when I heard about his suicide bombing. To be a suicide bomber, that's really something. Very few people can do it. I hope my other children do the same. This is a mother. This is a Palestinian Arab mother. <laughs> and every time there's a, a suicide bomber who kills Jews, they have parties. They send out invitations like a bar mitzvah. Uh, 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 the, the parties are filled with, the Associated Press wrote, they're filled with supportive neighbors. Bringing over casseroles, the 11-year-old sister is basking in the sudden attention. Classmates say how lucky she is to have a, a, a shahid, a martyr for a brother. The bomber's mother speaks of the 72 virgins and the friends of the Prophet Muhammad awaiting her son in paradise. This is that culture. Perez used to say, Shimon Perez, Arab mothers have the same concerns for children as Jewish mothers. No, they don't. I wish it were true. I wish it were true. <laughs> and we ignore this sort of thing. <laughs> and how about this, Mahmoud Abbas, a real peacemaker. <laughs> this is the actual emblem of the Palestinian Authority's Fatah party that rules the Palestinian Authority right now. The shape of all of Israel, the kafir over all of it. Not just, uh, uh, you know, not just the West Bank and Gaza. All of it has a kafir. Arafat in the center of Klishkanov rifle. Is this the emblem you commission if you want to make peace with the Jewish state? Why doesn't every Arab, uh, Israeli official on TV, when they go on or, or in speeches, hold up this and say, look of their emblem. This tells you everything. They have no interest in peace with us. They never do it. <laughs> and that's really tragic. And finally, when I meet with members of Congress, they always say, just give them a state, end this already. Give them a state that'll resolve it. You know, who can take this anymore all these years? <laughs> well, they turned down the state in 1937, 47, 48. 48 to 67, they controlled all of Judea and Samaria, Gaza, and Eastern Jerusalem. They could have had a state. They controlled it. They didn't set up a state. 2000, 2001, 2008, turned it down every single time. A state has been offered to them four times in the last 20 years, eight times in the last 80 years. The first one was 1937, the Peel Commission. 
they offered the Arabs 95% of the rest of Palestine. I remember Jordan already had 80%. 95%, the Jews get five. The Arabs said, no, we're not going to accept it. Uh, uh, uh. An Israel state. <laughs> and they were turned down every time and t until finally 2008, Ehud Omer made an insane offer. <laughs> Omer, the prime minister, offered 97% of Judea and Samaria, the West Bank, 3% of Israel proper to make up for the 3% of Judea and Samaria he couldn't give away because a half a million Jews live there. He can't throw them all out. <laughs> and Eastern Jerusalem and billions of dollars in aid. Abbas turned it down. I, I already had, before he turned out, I wrote articles saying, Omer is insane, he should be impeached, he should be with this is insane, what is he doing? But Abbas said no. I called Omer, who used to be my friend. <laughs> I said, how the hell did Abbas not accept your insane offer? He said, I know you thought it was insane. I said, how do you know? He said, I read your op-ed. <laughs> I said, well, why didn't he accept it? Abbas said, if you get rid of three clauses, I'll accept it. I said, what clauses? <laughs> One... I can't assign something that says we accept Israel as a Jewish state. We'll accept it as a state, not as a Jewish state. I can never sign that. <laughs> Two, you're limiting in this, in this uh, a clause that says I can only bring in 150,000 Palestinian Arabs into Israel. I don't want any limits. I can't have limits. I want to bring a million in if I want, which would destroy Israel as a Jewish state. And three, uh, a clause that says no further claims. He says I can't sign that. And Omer says, he said to him, but that's the deal. I'm giving you everything, so it's over. No further claims. I'm not signing anything that says no further claims. What more proof do you need <laughs> that they have no interest in peace with Israel? Land is not the issue. A Palestinian state is not the issue. They've offered them a state eight times in the last 80 years, four in the last 20, turned down every single time. <laughs> so the Jews in the world must understand <laughs> this Arab Islamic war against the Jews and the West <laughs> It's not about land. It's not about a Palestinian state. If it was, it would have been resolved back in the 30s. <laughs> it's a religious war. They won't accept it, a non-Muslim entity with sovereignty in the Middle East. <laughs> it's a religious war. You know what? I tell this to Israeli officials, that you have to tell the truth. It's a religious war. No! There's a billion and a half Muslims. That's a horror. I don't want to even get, begin to call it a religious war. But it is a religious war. There's no other explanation. <laughs> By the way, even in Africa, in the last 10 years... Black Muslims have massacred 52,000 black Christians in Africa. <laughs> they destroyed 20,000 churches and, and uh, 8,000 Christian schools. Why on campuses aren't they screaming about this? Because there are no Jews involved. <laughs> A religious war? <laughs> Al-Azhar University on October 19th. This is the leading Islamic the theological seminary in the world is in Cairo. Al-Azhar issued an edict, a fatwa, after October 7th, saying, we promote that it is right and you should kill every Jew you can. October 19th, a fatwa from the leading, leading Islamic seminary in Cairo said, kill every Jew. Imams regularly in America screaming, kill the Jews all the time in their sermons. We have the tapes. <laughs> Mahmoud Azar, the co-founder of Hamas, a month ago, put out a, 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 a speech he, he was giving. In this speech, he says, I want everyone to understand something. He said it in Arabic, <laughs> subtitles. <laughs> I want everyone to understand. First, we're going to kill all the Jews. But please understand, we're not done when we kill all the Jews. Next, we're going to kill all the despicable Christians and then all the other non-Muslims. And then we're going to establish a caliphate where Islam will rule the world. He said it a few weeks ago, Mahmoud Zahar said this, and then he ends it by saying, first the Saturday people, next the Sunday people. <laughs> and why isn't his speech, co-founder Hamas, on the front page of every newspaper? Imagine if an Israeli official said, we got to kill every Arab. It would, be, it would be all over the place. There'd be interviews, there'd be sanctions, the UN would go crazy. They say these things, and we don't believe them. That's why Soloveitchik said, the miracle of Purim, was that we believed them, that they wanted to kill all of us. <laughs> the one way we have to begin to minimize this Islamic war, <laughs> we have to tell our members of Congress to stop funding them, legitimizing them, whitewashing them, incentivizing them to do these terrible things. <laughs> there has to be a constant worldwide and UN condemnation of Hamas, Abbas, Fatah, Hezbollah, and such. <laughs> we need, as we did after World War II, we need to denazify the Palestinian Authority. 
denazified. We did that in Germany. We got rid of all the horrible books, and we, st we stopped from all the people who were giving horrible anti-Semitic speeches. We stopped them from doing this. And we have to uh, publicly scream about the fact that they pay, spend $400 million a year paying Arabs lifetime pensions to murder Jews. <laughs> so I will say, one of the things Israel has to do with Gaza, if Egypt doesn't allow the Arabs to move into, uh, uh, the Gaza Arabs to move into Egypt, we need a huge buffer in Gaza, or maybe even consider making it no man's land. Because when I spoke to people, and I was just in Israel only up two weeks ago, uh, Jews who lived in, northern, uh, in southern Israel and northern Israel, and I said, what will it take for you to go back? So many of them said to me, I can't have any Arabs in Gaza. I can't have any Arabs in southern Lebanon. I'm scared. We have to get rid of all of them. They made us think this way. We didn't want this. They made us think this way. And we have to actually consider, is that Jonathan Pollard actually wrote an op-ed this week saying that that's what has to happen. So even though the whole world is demanding a ceasefire uh, and a Palestinian state, by the way, you know, I, in the movie, Tom Hanks movie about baseball, remember a movie with Tom Hanks about baseball and that singer was in it? What's her name? Oh, that's it. Thank you, thank you. A league of their own. One of the women on the team started crying during a game. And Tom Hanks says, what, are you, what is this crying? There's no crying in baseball. There's no crying in baseball. Well, I say, what is this ceasefire? There's no ceasefire during war. Did you have a ceasefire during the Civil War, World War I, World War II, the Korean War, the Vietnam War? There's no ceasefire in war. You fight until you crush your enemy. <laughs> <laughs> this administration is now demanding a ceasefire, even without hostages, just unilateral ceasefire. He's demanding it right now. <laughs> I thought he said he supports Israel to crush Hamas. Well, if he supports it, they've got to go into Rafah. You can't have a ceasefire. If you say to Israel, as he's saying, don't go into Rafah because you'll kill too many civilians, he's supporting Hamas. <laughs> and... and uh, uh, the Israeli said he was so wonderful, he came to Israel two days after October 7th and said, I'm a Zionist and I support you destroying Hamas. He was wonderful. I said he wasn't wonderful. What do you mean he wasn't wonderful? Did you hear the speech? Yes. You missed an important line in the speech. Two days after October 7th, what did he say in that initial speech that everyone praised? We did not praise it. He said, what we need to resolve this is a Palestinian state. He said that in his initial speech. People ignored that. I didn't ignore it because a Palestinian state will be an Arab terrorist state on Israel's longest border, endangering Israel even more. Remember, Israel gave them a mini state in Gaza. What will they do with a, a much larger state in Judea and Samaria and Gaza? Uh, and by the way, <laughs> all the major organizations in the last month and a half after October 7th are publicly saying we need a Palestinian state. Yes, uh, 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 AJ committee, Ted Deutsch, made a speech, we need a Palestinian state. <laughs> Uh, APAC on their website, we need a Palestinian state. The head of the reform movement, Rick Jacobs, and nine other leaders of reform, we need a Palestinian state, and we condemn Bibi Netanyahu for rejecting a Palestinian state. This is in the last two months, not before October 7th, it would be bad, bad enough, <laughs> uh, supporting a state. This is insane. This is insane, uh, after we see what happened, to want to give them more power and more authority to do something. We must support Israel's destruction of Hamas Nazis, give Israel all the help it needs to finish the job. Because Israel's victory over the Arab terrorist Hamas will make all of us here in America, we will be safer without risking a single American life. We must be supporting this. We must always remember about Israel. <laughs> we Jews did not come to Eretz Israel as colonialists. We came neither like the British imperialists nor like the French colonizers in Algeria, nor like the English and Dutch settlers in South Africa. We did not come like emigrants seeking a new continent, a new homeland. We came back home to our ancient homeland as the inhabitants of a country who had been driven away from it by the force of people who hate Jews. <laughs> That's what we must remember. <laughs> so there will be miracles we can't foresee. I'm ending with this. <laughs> we can't foresee, with God's help, that we'll resolve this in ways we don't understand. We have to remember that we Jews, we arose from the onslaughts throughout the Middle Ages, from pogroms in the 1800s. We miraculously arose again from the ashes of Auschwitz to recreate our beautiful homeland. 
That is really the lesson of our history, that the indomitable spirit of the Jews, with our belief in ourselves and our culture and our talent and our Torah and in Almighty God, we can never be destroyed, for God promised that we would be an eternal people. And so the miracle of a Jewish state, due to another miraculous victory against great odds, a victory over 40 million Arabs, where we were vastly outnumbered, yet we recreated the Jewish state of Israel. <laughs> There'll be more miracles. We've had incredible miracles. We have to appreciate that throughout history. <laughs> Who would have believed that even though Israel was David and the huge Arab world was the Goliath, we, the Israeli Jews, won the wars in 48, 56, 67, 73. It was a miracle. Who would have believed that Israel, which began with 600,000 Jews 76 years ago, would now have 7 million Jews in Israel? It's a miracle. Who would have believed that Israel, which represents only 6% of the world's Jews, now represents half of the world's Jews. It's a miracle. And remember, the Torah promised us that there ultimately will be an ingathering of the exiles to Israel. And, you know, human beings would say that. We don't know if that'll happen, we humans. God controls history. He said there'll be ingathering. Now we have half the Jews of the world in Eretz Yisrael. <laughs> Who would have believed that Israel would have made the desert bloom? <laughs> and listen to this one. Just as the Holy Bible promised that the Holy Land will remain barren until the Jews return. And that's what happened. It was barren. In fact, the story of Gush Katif proves it, of Gaza. The land the Arabs called Gaza accursed. Nothing could grow there. As soon as the Jews came, they told the Jews, don't even try to farm, nothing will grow. It began to yield the most beautiful fruits, flowers and plants. The tiny portion of land in Gaza yielded at one time most of the agricultural exports of Israel. Yet when the Jews left, when they were thrown out in 2005, the land became useless again. Even the insects participated. The vegetables had been famously bug-free. Now they developed bugs. The thriving business of Gush Katif languished in the hands of the Arabs. <laughs> Even the managers who worked under the Jews and had all the expertise couldn't do it. Why not? The land wouldn't cooperate because God controls history. <laughs> Would human beings writing in the Torah if it was humans uh, say that as long as the Jews uh, are not there, the land will remain barren. Humans wouldn't write that because as soon as something would, would grow, you can throw the Bible out the window to prove that it's a lie. They wouldn't write such a thing. <laughs> but the Torah says it will remain barren until the Jews return. That's what happened. It's enough to make you keep Shabbos, late to fill in, and daven every Shabbos, and even every day. It's, it's so miraculous. <laughs> <laughs> and who would believe that we now have the most students studying yeshivas in Israel any time in history? And who would believe that Orthodox Jews would make up 40% of the officers of the Israeli army? It's extraordinary. And who would believe that for the first time in history, a country would bring black people, Ethiopian Jews, to its shores not to be slaves, but to be a free and proud people? That country is Israel, and that's extraordinary. <laughs> and who would believe... <laughs> After 2,000 years of dispersion, there are now over 500,000 Jews in the holy city of Jerusalem, 500,000 or more Jews in the holy land, Yehuda and Shimon, given to the Jewish people by the Lord our God, King of the universe. And after 2,000 years, we Jews have sovereignty over all the historically holy Jewish city of Jerusalem, never ever to be divided again, and that's a miracle. <laughs> so I'll end by saying, we need to be strong. We need to never be afraid, for God is with us. The cause of Israel is moral and just. We must act and speak out with courage. Our holy Torah promises that we're an eternal people, never to be destroyed. So it has been, so it will continue to be. With the strength and the help and the will of the Israeli people, with the help of the Israel Defense Forces, with the help of Almighty God, new miracles that we can't foresee will make it clear that the people of Israel will dwell in their holy land for eternity. We will prevail. Thank you very, very much. That's great. Thank you so much. What's that? Thank you so much. That was great. Thank you. I appreciate it.